Back in March, Twitter suspended the account of the massively popular Christian satire site The Babylon Bee after it awarded Man of the Year honors to Rachel Levine, a trans woman serving in the Biden administration's Department of Health and Human Services who had been named one of USA Today's Women of the Year. The Babylon Bee's editor-in-chief, Kyle Mann, says that the article was intended to satirize media treatment of identity politics, not demean trans people. We love trans people and we love, you know, we, we don't we don't consider people like that beneath us. You know, the Christian worldview is that everybody, ha everybody has the opportunity to be saved, you know, and we can love everybody. And I'm, I'm no more deserving of God's grace than a transgender person is. But when the culture bows down and starts handing out trophies to people for stuff like this is when we say, hey, wait a minute, we need to protect women <laughs> in our society as well. The Bee's Twitter account remains locked because the publication steadfastly refuses to delete the tweet and acknowledge it contravened Twitter's policy against hate speech. In response to the Twitter ban and persistent demonetization and minimizing of the reach of its content at Facebook, the Bee has created its own social network and subscription model, both of which are flourishing. The episode shines a light on how contemporary culture wars are waged online and illustrates the specific travails that evangelical Christians face in a country that is increasingly secular and socially liberal. Reason caught up with Mann at Freedom Fest, the annual gathering in Las Vegas, to talk about why he loves making fun of Donald Trump and Joe Biden, but saves his deepest burns for megachurch pastors such as Joel Osteen, why he believes that the left and Gen Z can't deal with humor that makes fun of them, and why he loves personal liberty and personal freedom, even if it creates a culture that is deeply hostile to his faith. Kyle Mann, thanks for talking to Reason. Yeah, thanks for having me. You have uh, been editor-in-chief of the Babylon Bee since 2016. I've been with the Babylon or, Bee since 2016, uh, but um, I, I first was just part-time. I was in construction mm -hmm. sales and writing headlines before I went into right. my soul-sucking job. And, uh, and the soul-sucking job is at the Babylon Bee? No, now. no, no, oh, at yeah, my okay. construction sales yes. job, yes. And uh, the Babylon Bee sucks your soul in a different way because you yeah. have to read the news, you know, which is... That is dead, whole other thing. right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> so uh, when did you become editor-in-chief? In, in uh, 2018. 2018. Yeah, two okay. years later. Yeah. You um, recently tweeted you, uh, something to the effect of you love your job, and you did a screen cap of the Babylon Bee from like a day or two ago. Uh, and I just wanted to go through some of the headlines and get your commentary on that, because I think it's a good way to kind of sum up where the Babylon Bee is right now. And like the main headline is uh, in the, the well of the uh, page, up yours woke moralist cries Jordan Peterson while attempting to ride the ostriches at the zoo. That's one story. <laughs> also near the top is Americans offer to trade LeBron to Russia for Brittany Griner. Uh, time travel, and then subscriber headlines, time traveling Joel Osteen gives job uh, uh, gives jo uh, Job, Job a cop, Job, as in the biblical book of Job, a copy of Your Best Life Now. Trump's children changed their last name to Biden so that media will ignore them. Uh, why do we start with those types of things? Like how, you know, you said, I love my job. Like what, what's great about the Jordan Peterson? Well, the, that morning I had spent an hour photoshopping Jordan Peterson onto an ostrich. Right. And, and there's these surreal moments when you're, when you're running the Bevel up <laughs> where you're sitting there like, am I really getting paid for this? Yeah. How, how does this work? You know, how, how, how did I get to this point, mm -hmm. you know? Um, you know, even here at Freedom Fest talking to some these comedy legends like John Cleese. Yep. And, you know, you're just like, you know, people that are, you know, you're a distinguished interviewer and you get to interview John Cleese. Yeah. And you're like, you can have a sense of, well, I'm, I'm really good at interviewing, right, so I right. got to this point. I'm like I write I photoshopped Jordan Peterson on an ostrich and I get to talk to John Cleese. So what? It was a moment yeah. of the surreal uh, realization that I'm that my job is is so awesome. Like yeah. we get to create this alternate world and then write the newspaper about it. Right. You know. So it's such a fun, creative, Rem imaginary thing. Remind me what does the Babylon B uh, respond? Uh, what is that reference as a? Because you guys are Christian, you're, yeah. you're Bible-based evangelical Christians. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and and you believe the Bible is the inerrant word of yes. God. Yes. Okay. So, this is all as a backdrop of saying you you're being funny and you have tied five hands behind your back because this <laughs> just adds to the level of complexity. But what what does the title the Babylon Bee refer yeah, to? Yeah. So Babylon is a biblical reference to a time when Israel was in Babylonian captivity, mm -hmm. Babylonian exile. 
And, uh, you know, there was this sense where Israel had to maintain their identity as the people of God, mm -hmm. despite no longer having the promised land. Right. Um, and so that's where we are as Christians in America. You know, we don't, America is not the promised land. Uh, it never was the promised right. land, and yet we're grateful for, obviously, all the freedoms yeah. we have in America. And yet we have to go, but we're exiles. We're strangers in a, in in a, a different strange place. strange right? But, but there's a sense of humor yeah. that comes with that. You know, there's a... You have to have a, a sense of joy about that, I think, to what survive. Is the, uh, what is the bee in that? Because the bee, uh, or the beehive is, uh, has biblical uh, dimensions to it, but it's also a very Mormon. Uh, the Mormon yeah, there was no, there was no Mormon uh, <laughs> reference there that we were attempting to I don't to. think so, yeah. <laughs> it was a, uh, it's got a stinger, mm -hmm. which is great for satire. Okay. Um, and, you know, we were kind of picking through different newspaper names, you know, right. the Courier, the Time. Yeah. And Babylon Bee has that great... Yeah, alliteration, and alliteration there's the Sacramento B. So I mean, yeah. it's not an unknown name for it. Right. Um, so I realize this is the worst thing that uh, I could be asking. You talked to John Cleese yesterday. I did. But so I'm going to do the worst thing possible and say, what is funny about a headline that says, up yours woke more or less cries Jordan <laughs> Peterson while attempting to ride the ostriches? Episode? Well, uh, yeah, because Jordan Peterson is uh, riding an ostrich. Yeah. So that's... What, what's your sense of Peterson? Um, is, uh, do you, I mean, I assume that you like him because liberals and progressives hate him. They find him intolerable and, and just every extra book he sells, it makes their head explode a little bit more. <laughs> um, but do you also, do you think he is, because he's certainly not a Christian, um, and, you know, do you like the content of his ideas or is it mostly just that he is a, a, a flashpoint for the, the people that you dislike. He's great for jokes, mm -hmm. first of all. Um, being able to write in a voice like Jordan Peterson, whenever we write a Peterson article, you get people that are commenting saying, I read the entire thing in his voice, you know, because yeah, <laughs> right. he has yeah, that whiny kind of voice. Trump was yeah. similar. Trump was great to write jokes yeah. about because you write quotes in Trump's voice and people yeah. are like, it's exactly how he would say it. So he's great for comedy. I never really followed Peterson that much until, I don't know, a year or two ago, I, I picked up 12 rules and I, I thought it was good wisdom, you know. Right. It was interesting as from a Christian perspective that he, he hasn't embraced the Christian faith, but he draws yeah. a lot of wisdom and applications from and probably knows the Bible better than a lot of Christians do. Mm -hmm. So it's been interesting to see a mind like his kind of go on this journey. He's come mm -hmm. close to Christianity and then right. woven back the other way. And, um, you know, I, I think about if I was a contemporary of someone like C.S. Lewis, who was converted mm -hmm. later in life, you know, he was this brilliant philosopher in his own right and brilliant professor in his own right, brilliant author, and then comes to faith, you know, and mm -hmm. I, I see a similar Kind of You're hoping of Jordan that Peterson's Jordan life. Peterson's going to join your team at some point, right? Well, and if we ever staring... get to interview him, we'll try to convert him. But, okay. Yeah. And uh, C.S. Lewis, I <laughs> want to get into your theology a little bit later, but isn't he a little too Catholic for you? Well, he's Anglican. Yeah, so but there... I mean, he's a J.V. Catholic, and he, he's, <laughs> he's a pussy. Like, he knows he's Catholic, but he can't be a Catholic <laughs> because he's in England, and then that's a whole problem. You know... Uh, yeah, maybe some of the traditions are a little more Catholic, but that's, yeah. you know, J.R. Tolkien's my favorite author, and he's uh, hardcore Very Catholic. Catholic. Oh, he my God. Hate, that's why I, me, I, you know? I was raised Catholic, and I can't <laughs> read The Hobbit. You know, it's like, like I lived it. Yeah. Um, what about the, uh, uh, the LeBron James, uh, you know, American offers to trade LeBron to Russia for Brittany Griner, and she's the women NBA star uh, who's being held in a Russian prison for having weed vapes. Yeah. Um, you know, again, why is it so funny to trade LeBron to Russia? <laughs> because, uh, you know, we're offering to trade him for Brittany. It's a great joke. It's okay. Great. And uh, you always say that. Like, yeah. you never explain the joke, but it's obvious that they're not equivalent in terms of basketball skill and what, like, uh, whatnot, but, uh, or, or presence. I well, mean, LeBron is kind of represented, you know, for jokes. He's such a great punching bag because he does have the smug, like, I am better mm -hmm. than everybody and I hate America, and yet America has given me everything that I right. have. Um, so those kinds of, of personalities are great punching bags. Do you, do you think, and you know, for me, the, uh, I, I, you know, LeBron James is like a fantastic athlete and to the extent that that matters, you, you got to kind of admire that and give that. And then, um, you know, he was a rank hypocrite in terms of when Black Lives Matter took place, he said, you know, the NBA should allow or foreground protests by players about George Floyd and Black Lives Matter. And then when it came to people saying like, hey, we want to protest, you know, the mistreatment of Uyghurs and other people in China, he was like, you better shut up. 
and you don't have any Shut right. up and drip. Yeah, is that, I mean, even as he was refusing to do that when other people were saying, is that the nut of why LeBron bugs you? Um, I don't even know that he bugs me that much. I don't get mm -hmm. too, I try not to get too passionate about the stuff that we're joking about. Like, it's a great joke, and, you know, anytime you have somebody who uh, is stuck up, there's mm -hmm. a, and hypocrisy, and that's another mm -hmm. area where that's great for humor, you know, anybody who's a hypocrite, and that's why Christians have been a great punching bag for right. years, you know, <laughs> because yeah. people hone in on hypocrisy within Christians right. really easily. Uh, which uh, brings me to the, uh, the headline, time-traveling time Joel Osteen gives Job a copy of Your Best Life Now. Explain, I mean, if you follow the Christian world at all, everybody knows who Joel Osteen is, but some secular people might not. Who is Joel Osteen and why is this funny? Yeah, so he's a soft prosperity gospel preacher, you know, that kind of has this idea. It's a, a very associated with the word faith movement and, you know, the whole the secret and everything mm -hmm. the, that, that comes with that. That um, you can speak wealth into existence. You can speak health into existence. Your words have creative power. Um, which and is, also kind of if you're right with God, you're going to do extremely well right. in, in this it, world. It takes the Proverbs to the, to the extreme. You know, mm -hmm. it takes the Proverbs which say, like, work hard and, and you'll be blessed. Mm -hmm. But the Proverbs are a general principle that say, in general, if you work hard, then you're going to reap the rewards of that. Right. But it takes that as this kind of, like, divine promise that if mm -hmm. I put in the work, God is going to uh, reward me with health and wealth. And it's really, it's really devious because it's... It tells people who have cancer, mm -hmm. it's your fault. You don't have enough faith. Mm -hmm. You haven't given enough money. You haven't done enough. Um, and so we've, from day one, really punched yeah. at the the At the bright, guy. shining teeth of Joel Osteen. Yeah. He <laughs> the, has he's like got a, great teeth. you yeah. got to admit that. Yeah. I, I don't know where they came from. I don't think they're natural. That might have, They might have come directly from God or Satan. <laughs> or Satan, has, Satan has great teeth, right? I'm yeah, assuming he's got a really good smile. Um, but Austin, yeah, you you mocked him like whenever there's a natural disaster, Joel Austin in a in a, a Babylon Bee headline shows up giving out his and giving own out bucks, a copy right? of his book. Yeah. And then Job, how you know Job is obviously uh, you know the the one of the more interesting characters in the Old Testament. Just briefly recap, uh, you know why Job? Matters. Yeah, Satan basically gets permission from God to. Uh, beat up Job for a while, and he loses all his livestock and his family and his farms, and he's left mm -hmm. with just his nagging wife and boils on himself. And it's right. almost a tragic comedy, you yeah. know, one of those dark comedies. It's, it really reflects well. Well, that's the Old Testament God, right? Yeah, right. I mean, yeah, so. Right. right. But so uh, <laughs> Job just needs to buck up. Um, uh, Trump's children change their last name to Biden so that the media will ignore them. Yeah, that's and that's another right. example where hypocrisy, especially in the media, is a great mm -hmm. target for us. Because um, everybody's sitting there, see, we all see it. We all see what's happening in the media, how they treat one side completely differently mm -hmm. from the other side. And when you can just shine a light on that, as yeah. our satirical newspaper does. That's great. Do you, um, you know, I remember we talked, I think, uh, three years ago, you talked to Reason a couple times, and um, you guys, you, you were hitting Trump pretty hard and things like that. A lot of people said, as Trump kind of went on, you, you got a little bit softer on him and you started going after liberals more. Do you think that's a fair criticism? Um, or, did your, or did your focus change for other reasons or your focus did not change? I think we went after Trump harder than we've ever gone after anyone on the left. Mm -hmm. And we still do a lot of good jokes about Trump. Um, you know, I, I, think there's a, I think there's a lot of humor to be found in Trump. The problem with Trump humor is that the left was doing it so much mm -hmm. and so poorly that it just kind of it didn't interest me anymore. Yeah. It doesn't interest me to say Trump has orange skin and he's stupid. Yeah. You know, like, okay, mm -hmm. let's let's come up with something more clever. So when right. Trump humor can really play with his character and, and realize that he already he's already funny in his own right. You don't right. need to you don't need to add anything. <laughs> yeah. And you can just, you just write gotta something. You got to get out of the way. You got to right? roll you got to roll with his character. Once we realized that, I think the Trump humor really became more fun like yeah. that. But but, it, we, but we've called we had a joke, you know, that said that people who vote for Trump are like voting for the antichrist or something, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> yeah. So so it's like we never done that kind of savage stuff on the left. So there was something where we were punching our own a little harder. Mm -hmm. Uh do you consider Trump a Christian? I don't think so. Yeah. I mean, he says he is. Well, there was a... Uh, and he held the Bible, like, I'm pretty sure he had, like, a Teflon glove 
on because he's Satan, and if he touches the Bible, his hand would well, burn. I think we or did something. a I think we did a, a bee joke on that that he he was rushed to the hospital with uh, with severe burns. On yeah. His hand, so, uh, <laughs> and when he was asked like, "What's your favorite book in the Bible?" and he was like, "All of them." Yeah, and, it's and like he said, obviously could not name a sing. He could not say name Gen- Genesis or a single gospel. <laughs> well, then he said two Corinthians, which is not how we say it. <laughs> but uh, I heard him speak. I heard him speak at uh, at, the, at uh, Faith and Freedom in Nashville, and he mm-hmm. he he was making fun of himself for not knowing the Bible. He says, yeah. "I know I don't know the Bible as well as other right. people know the Bible." And I think he realizes, like, "Oh wow, I'm in the space where I'm a complete noob." And, why uh, did Why did evangelicals? I mean, they supported him incredibly strongly and i realize maybe outside of your expertise but you're an evangelical you must know people who were like yeah i voted for trump yeah. but i mean he is a dis like on a personal level you know he seems to be a despicable character as a businessman you know everybody says he cheats on them and he's you know it's just awful his personal life is a mess he is a kind of horrible character why and he is patently not a christian but got the christian vote Af- yeah, and he, yeah, and he was one of the few politicians who actually did a lot of the things he said he was going to do. Yeah. Um, so you think they knew that? Uh, well, yeah, I think maybe they got that sense from him. But it, but also, like, some people just hated Hillary. I mean, yeah. there there was a real revulsion to Hillary mm-hmm. across the board. And, you know, it was that left versus right thing and the binary mm-hmm. choice that, you know, I don't know if it, if we didn't have that binary choice, if Trump would you know, have... No, it was a trader. There was a man named Gary Johnson who <laughs> died a criminal's death. Yeah. He, uh, you know, he Aleppo. just didn't... Yeah. Um, the the Trump stuff led to one of the most bizarre moments, I think, in, in my lifetime in a lot of ways, where um, I like to think every once in a while, you know, that we're living in a Philip K. Dick universe, a science fiction writer yeah, right. who, you know, just, you know, where the world is insane in ways we can't fully appreciate. But you guys in, uh, uh, I think it was 2018 uh, or thereabouts, you published a headline saying that Trump uh, takes credit for doing more for Christianity than Jesus. Uh, and then uh, literally a couple of years later, I mean, I guess it was this year or last year, Trump actually said, I've done more. And he said it a couple of times in different contexts. I have done more for religion or for Christianity than anybody else. One in history. <laughs> um, how, do, you know, how do you deal with that? I just think he's a, he's a big, lovable uh, guy that, you know, can... Yeah. I, and, 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 and I think that he doesn't, I don't think Trump takes himself as seriously as his haters think mm-hmm. he does. I yeah. think he says these big boisterous things because he knows it gets a reaction. He knows it gets applause and laughter mm-hmm. and, you know, he's a character. Yeah. So he, he's a cartoon character and I think he leans into that. Do you want him to come back into American politics or do, or do you, are you a partisan? Do you? I don't, uh, I don't really care one way or the other. Yeah. I mean, it'd be great for comedy. So yeah. I'll take that. <laughs> okay. Um, although it's kind of bad for comedy, right? And you've pointed this out and other people well, who work with Well, it's bad for comedy you. when you don't understand him. But mm-hmm. it was great for us. Yeah. That allowed us to have this meteoric rise where we were doing great Trump jokes mm-hmm. because the late night uh, liberals didn't know how to do it. You yeah. Know? They were going very, yeah, I mean, the easy, obvious. The easy, it's obvious. It's not even low-hanging yeah. fruit. It's like Trump. That's His name is not Trump. It's Trump. Yeah. Like that's, that's comedy gold in the late night mm-hmm. comedy world. What do you? Why do you think uh, late night comedy, even places like The Onion, which is still doing well, but seems to have lost something of an edge? Is it? Is it just simply that as liberals retake power, um, you know, because Trump came in and you know the Republicans were running, you know, Congress uh, and the White House, they have the Supreme Court and things like that. Um, that's gone. And do, does comedy suffer when your team? for lack of a better term, is is kind of running the show. It, it can. I think you have to be more careful. I, mm-hmm. I don't really buy into the punch up, punch down paradigm where comedy mm-hmm. can only punch up. And so if you're yeah. if you're out of power, then you're funny. And if you're in power, then it's not funny because it's punched down. I, I don't really buy into that. I, I do think, like I was talking earlier about how Christians were such a great target because Christians are self-serious, mm-hmm. Christians are dour, Christians have this obvious hypocrisy in a lot of areas. Mm-hmm. Well, I think that describes the woke liberal far left right now. Mm-hmm. Like that is who they are. You know, they're hypocritical mm-hmm. in the way that they treat uh, other people. And mm-hmm. they say that we're against racism and yet a lot of their policies are racist. Mm-hmm. Um, they take themselves very seriously because politics is their religion. You mm-hmm. know, they believe in salvation, but they believe in salvation through wokeism. And, and uh, they believe in salvation for our country, but only by voting for the right policies. Mm-hmm. And so if you make fun of them, you're making fun of their religion. Yeah. Um, you, uh, the Babylon Bee, published a, a guide to wokeism or wokeness. Um, 
What do you think, uh, define wokeness briefly, and then what is driving it? Because this is something, you know, when people will quibble over stuff, but certainly over the past 20 years, but over the past five years or so, wokeness has become a real thing that is everywhere around us. Yeah, well, I don't pretend to be a cultural expert or anything, but in my limited experience of what I've observed, it has been this like flashpoint in the last year or two that is just, you know, you, you heard the word woke kind of being mm-hmm. thrown around five years ago, but it wasn't it wasn't this big cultural thing where mm-hmm. I, I can talk to my neighbor and say woke, and they're like, ah, I hate mm-hmm. woke people, or I love yeah. woke, you know, there's a, now everybody on the street knows what that is. Right. But uh, yeah, wokeness is a very, it, it's a tough thing because it is a moving target. It is... I think at its core, it is kind of the Marxist-ish, and I won't say it's exactly defined with classical Marxism or anything, but it is the Marxist-ish idea that there's oppressors and oppressed, Mm -hmm. you know, and they they just kind of take that and apply it to different areas, Mm -hmm. whether that's gender or race or or nationality, and and, and that's where you find all your misery from. Why do you think that viewpoint has captured, if, if, if it hasn't become, if it's not something the masses believe in, it's something that the elite, uh, particularly on the left side of the political spectrum, really is going going deep on. Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I think there's probably a lot of white guilt going around, and it's a mm-hmm. way to deal with it. Um, you see that because they pay, you know, Robin DeAngelo fifty thousand dollars speaking fees or whatever mm-hmm. to show up and tell them how evil they are. Mm-hmm. Um, but I mean, ultimately, I think I think people need a I think people need a way to salvation and, and redemption, and they need that narrative in their lives. Mm-hmm. And if they can say, well, here's my sin, I was, I'm an, my ancestors were evil, and then they can find a way to atone for it by doing better, I think that helps them, you know, mm-hmm. in their mind at least. Do you think it is, uh, do you think American culture is becoming more secular and less religious uh, over, you know, over the past 20 years, 30 years? Yeah, 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 absolutely. You know, and, there's a few, but 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 I think there's well, and I was going to ask like if that's the case. Uh, so maybe people, you know, uh, maybe we assume that there is a fixed amount of people always want to find salvation. The phrase you use, and it used to be you found salvation through religion, and if religion is gone, then you look, you seek for it, and you seek it in other secular passion. Well, I mean, I believe people are created to worship. I believe people are created to find meaning mm-hmm. and. If you don't find meaning in the church, you're going to find meaning somewhere else. Mm-hmm. So people aren't leaving the church. They're going and finding their own church. Mm-hmm. And it happens to be the religion of wokeism on the left. Right. Um, so one of the things, um, you know, that is interesting is that you've been, you know, for years now, you guys have been in this interesting kind of war. Uh, and I think you you all must own Snopes.com because... <laughs> When, you know, the minute that they started fact-checking you as a, a bad source, as misinformation, because people, they said that people were uniquely taking the Babylon Bee as truth, uh, you know, and, and that needs to be fact-checked. Like, I mean, that gives you, you know, you, you get more coverage, you get more readers, people are interested, and it's funny. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Why do you think there is a concerted effort, and it's not just Snopes, it's also CNN and whatnot, um, there is this interest in kind of delegitimating the Babylon Bee as, you know, I mean, it's a satirical site that can't be missed, but there seems to be this attempt to say, you guys aren't legitimate because people are mis- are taking you seriously, which is not really true <laughs> uh, to begin with, but then, and that means you shouldn't be doing satire. Yeah, it's an interesting question, and I don't fully know the answer, but it does it does seem like the left is very confused by comedy that makes fun of the left. They don't understand it. Mm-hmm. They don't get it they, because they're used to controlling these cultural institutions. They're used to controlling the late night shows and the satire sites and all of that. And so when all of a sudden we come along and we have a hopefully a good sense of humor and mm-hmm. we're, you know, we're writing comedy that people are finding funny, they think there's some like nefarious motive there. Mm-hmm. And that's what they always say in these fact checks. They're intentionally muddying the waters of a, of a current event news story to mm-hmm. confuse people. Like that's the accusation that's made, which is so insane. Like we're, we're writing very similar jokes to the jokes that the other guys are writing on right. the other side. And we're just writing them from our perspective. But I, I, I really think that they don't understand that we, we just want we just want to put humor out into the world. You know, we want mm-hmm. to put laughter out into the world. Yeah, a lot of it's going to come from our worldview or our, right. our perspective, but whose isn't? So I think there's a there's a real confusion over it. You know, that we'll we'll write articles that'll make fun of ourselves. Mm-hmm. You know, where we write a you know we make fun of Jordan Peterson writing an ostrich or whatever, um, or like we wrote an article that was supposed to make fun of really bad 
Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez humor, where mm -hmm. we said that she tied up, you know, she was trying to tie her shoelaces and she accidentally strangle, strangled herself. Right. And the headline says, because she is an idiot, right. or because she's so stupid. And we were really mocking the kind of over the top, yeah. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is an idiot memes that it just kind of became as stale as the Trump is an idiot right. memes. And people on the left freaked out and said, this is such a bad joke. You mm -hmm. know, and we're kind of just sitting there snickering like, yeah, that's the yeah. point. You know, but they, they really just thought that we didn't have a sense of humor about ourselves because mm. they, they couldn't, they can't comprehend conservatives that have a sense of humor. <laughs> right. Um, one of the, uh, in an interview with The Atlantic that you gave uh, last fall, uh, you talked about how, um, you know, if you have to, you will, you, you identify more your humor with the baby boom generation or you'll, you'll take the, uh, you'll side with boomer humor over kind of zoomer humor, Gen Z humor. <laughs> um, you are, you're 35. So yeah. you're, you're a millennial and you're, you're probably, I guess maybe even closer to Gen Z than, you know, Gen X at that point. Sure. And, and that what, um, talk a little bit about generational humor and, and you, I think in that interview, you said that, uh, you know, a lot of your readers are boomers. Um, and they kind of get it in a way that younger people don't. Yeah, there's a, uh, well, I, you know, I just think there's a split. Most of the time I'm at a conference, people will say, mm -hmm. my college son loves your stuff, yeah. or my grandpa lo loves your stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> That's always, always what it is. They never like my stuff. No, it's of course their, not. Like, yeah, they're <laughs> holding a gun on you when they're <laughs> yeah. saying that. But, uh, you know, so, the, so I think there's an interesting thing in that it does appeal to multiple people. But the, uh, to me, boomer humor was this kind of classic... Seinfeld, Cheers, um, mm -hmm. you know, and I know that's during the Gen X uh, era. Right, yeah, it's a 90 or but 80s and 90s. But you know, that's, yeah. when, that's when boomers were yeah, 30 yeah. or 40 and we're watching yeah, yeah. that stuff and tuning into it. Um, there's a classic, you know, just, just good old-fashioned men do this, women do this. Mm -hmm. um, isn't that silly? Observational humor about life. And now it seems like, you know, with Gen Z's humor, they, they, they subvert that and they say, no, there's no punchline. You watch a TikTok video, there's no punchline. It's something crazy happens and then the video cuts off. Mm -hmm. There's there's like a nihilism to the humor, yeah. <laughs> you know. And I think absurdity can be great in, in humor, of course. But, you know, then they, they go and they attack everybody that built all these great um, cultural institutions for mm -hmm. comedy, you know, whether that's Saturday Night Live mm -hmm. or all the classic sitcoms or Calvin and Hobbes. I mean, these mm -hmm. are things that, like, these are heights to which, you know, I don't think Gen Z humor can ever aspire mm -hmm. to be, you know, and we'll see what comes of it. But yeah. Is part of it that um, older forms of humor and, and boomer humor, and I'm thinking like early Saturday Night Live, which is, you know, made by the early boomers, were parroting, you know, TV shows from the 50s and the 60s and kind of broadly held, uh, you know, cultural templates. So people had a common culture. Mm. So you knew what the form of a presidential address was. You knew what the form of a sitcom was, et cetera. And like you can satirize that kind of thing as we get into an age where, people have less and less in common or consume fewer forms in common, it becomes hard to do satire. I agree with that. And I also think social media is, is you know, it creates all these little subcultures. Mm -hmm. it, it shortens people's attention spans. You know, even, even you look at the format of comedy on TikTok, where mm -hmm. if you don't make the joke in three seconds, people yep. flip to the next video. You know, people used to have a longer attention span where they could they could track with a sketch that was six or seven minutes long. You know, you look at Monty Python sketches that just mm -hmm. go on and on and are absurd and don't have a point, right. but <laughs> yeah, yeah. but go on and it, and you're willing to let the joke develop and you're right. willing to let the little narrative arc build. And that's great. I also think that reporter was asking me about boomer humor. I just got a little annoyed <laughs> yeah. because she, she was like, uh, she was saying, oh, a lot of boomers like your stuff. Are you ashamed to be associated with boomer humor? Yeah. Do you want like, to come out? Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm a, I'm a boomer and I'm kind of ashamed to be yeah. associated with that but um, you know uh, you talk about social media and fragmentation from a kind of religious point of view or from a Christian point of view isn't it kind of good though that um, you live or we live in a world where the barriers to entry are pretty low and that a lot of different groups I mean this is part of the certainly uh, the Protestant Reformation and as it came out of England in the 17th century it was kind of great that anybody who wanted to could start a church and had the freedom to do that. Isn't that somewhat analogous to, uh, you know, the landscape we're in where it's like, if you believe this thing, you know, whether it's religion or media or whatever, you can kind of create that world and try to draw adherence to your community. Well, I think it's a double-edged sword. So I'm not mm -hmm. completely down on social media. Obviously the Babylon Bee wouldn't exist without right. it because we were able to say, Hey, you know, do you like the onion? But 
hate when they uh, are really bad at humor because they're too you know absorbed in the leftist mm -hmm. worldview or whatever. Here's something that here's comedy that yeah. doesn't hate you. You mm -hmm. know, <laughs> right? That was kind of the pitch. You know, like, yeah. we'll we'll make fun of you too, but we don't hate you. You know, that mm -hmm. was kind of the the way the way that it got popular. So obviously, we were able to find a subculture right. using that that we wouldn't have been able to launch the yeah. Babylon Bee on you know network TV or something, getting right. some deal there. Then, yeah, or or just through people. traditional print. Or traditional right. print yeah. would be hard to find yeah. that audience too. Yeah. Um, so let's talk a little bit about social media because you've been in a uh, in a kind of fight or a standoff now with Twitter. Uh, you you still are on Facebook and you have a massive presence there, right? Well, it, it's very suppressed by Facebook. Okay, what does that? We've mean? been demonetized and deplatformed several times by Facebook, okay. and they. When you say demonetized, that means well, like our, we'll we'll get either videos demonetized. We've had mm -hmm. when we get those fact checks that come up, mm -hmm. we get dings on our account where we can't monetize no. until we take certain steps. Okay, and we also have been told that we our site is rated low for sharing uh, false information. Mm -hmm. So now whenever you see a Babylon B.com, even if you share it from your personal page, Facebook flags okay. that as like this is bad information we can't spread. Although this. you you have a large presence on Facebook. We, we have a large but following, but it's just yeah. our followers don't see our content yet. Okay. Um, but you are on Facebook. You're yes. active on right. Facebook. Um, on Twitter um, you have been, you were banned um, when you uh, named Rachel Levine, who's an assistant secretary of health, uh, who's transgender. She transitioned from a man to a woman, I think in 2010 or 11. Um, and you, you named her man of the year. And that triggered a Twitter response. Can you walk us through what happened? Yeah. So we, we gave Rachel Levine a prestigious man of the year award. And, uh, and we were sent a message a few days later that mm -hmm. Uh, you're locked out of your account, you know, you have to recant. <laughs> okay. you, you have committed hateful conduct and you are calling for violence against somebody and acknowledge our hateful conduct policies and click mm -hmm. this button to delete the tweet and acknowledge that you've committed hateful conduct. Mm -hmm. and, and is that the actual language? Yeah, they I, use, I, I'm, I'm paraphrasing. Okay. Uh, I could find the, the okay. original opinion. But did, and did they, did they though, um, say that this was committing violence or leading there, to violence. If you click on the, this says, you yeah. know, you committed hateful, please review our hateful conduct policy. Mm -hmm. You click on it and it says calling for violence against okay. people, calling for. So it's part of a list, but they're not necessarily list. saying that tweet. It wasn't you were typed calling custom for, okay. for us, yeah, but it was okay. part of that language, yeah. yeah. Okay. And so they said, uh, you know, you, you got to get rid of this tweet and then we'll unlock the account. Right. Okay, and you guys have chosen not to. We, right. Okay, and can you walk us through the logic of that? There, was, I, there wasn't a ton of discussion. It was very much, we got together and said, we're not deleting this, right? Mm -hmm. And it, it felt, it just felt, there's a humiliation, like bow before Twitter and, mm -hmm. and apologize and acknowledge, you know, you're calling someone who is a biological male, no, mm -hmm. no matter what Rachel Levine identifies as. And really, we weren't even making fun of Rachel Levine so much. We were making fun of the fact that USA Today named Rachel Levine one of their Women of the Year, mm -hmm. and so this had kind of blown up on social media. Yeah. You know that that transgender people have started to take awards away from biological women. And right. We're starting to erase that category in our society. And we said, well, you know, we're not going to delete this tweet, and we just kind of announced that on all the channels that we were still able to right. access. You know, on our personal Twitter profiles. Yeah, and yeah. Stuff. And you have your personal Twitter account as well. I got up and running. mine got deleted shortly after that. Got I got locked out as well, mm -hmm. and then uh, I was able to get back on. Though. How did you get back on? I then? appealed it, and okay. I was able. I, I had made a joke about something how like. If the Babylon Bee had only committed genocide against Uyghurs, then we mm -hmm. would be allowed on Twitter. Right. And they flagged that for violence. Yeah. yeah. Did you retweet the the headline about Rachel Levine I don't think in I your did. personal account? Because would that have bounced you or would. whatever? I think pretty quickly we were like, okay, let's not share it on our personal pages because if we do yeah. that... All of a sudden, we're going to have no ability to access anything. But we'll leave the main account locked. So you're um, talking about the Rachel Levine joke. It's, I mean, you're kind of, this is, uh, there was a South Park episode uh, shortly after Caitlyn Jenner mm -hmm. transitioned. And the, the punchline of that was that everybody, no matter what, at every moment in the show would stop and talk about how Caitlyn Jenner was an incredibly brave, you know, a, a, and courageous person. Um, you're saying that that's the joke, really, that you're making with Rachel Levine, that it's kind of the, it's the larger cultural response 
that you're parodying or that you're making a comment. Yeah, on, it's the you know? it's the absolute. You know, obviously we we love trans people and we love you know mm -hmm. we, we don't we don't consider people like that beneath us. You know, the Christian worldview is mm -hmm. that everybody ha everybody has the opportunity to be saved. You know, yeah. and we can love everybody. And I'm I'm no more deserving of God's grace than a transgender person is. Right. But when the culture bows down and starts handing out trophies to people for stuff like this is when we say, hey, wait a minute, mm -hmm. we need to protect women yeah. <laughs> in our society as well. And uh, do, you think, uh, do you think trans people have, are, are they mentally ill that they want to it's transition? Probably, I mean, uh, probably nowadays there's a lot of social, mm -hmm. a lot of social pressure as well as, as yeah. we've seen among a lot of trans, transgender teens. Um, especially women. Uh, so, you know, one of the things that's interesting is the re your response, the Babylon Bee's response to Twitter, like you're saying, okay, we're not, we're not going back on Twitter. Um, and you seem to be holding pretty firm to that. That's one thing. Um, and do you, do you agree that Twitter, you know, has a right to kind of throw people off if they want? Like you might disagree with it, but... I'm I'm of I'm of two minds about it mm -hmm. because I see both sides of the argument, you know. On the one hand, yes, they are a, a private Right. Company, you know, and I, I don't know that I want to see a world where the government is sending uh, regulators into, yeah. uh, you know, bureaucrats into right. Twitter and what are you guys doing and give us reports on censorship. Mm -hmm. and anytime you give government that kind of power, you know, it only grows and never, right. it never comes down. On the other hand, if they are acting as de facto censors for the federal government, you know, we, how are they doing that? Well, because they're talking with the government, you know, we know that they're communicating with the White House about who they want censored and, and, mm -hmm. and you know, and all that. So. I mean, we had a, we had a person who was an ex CIA agent come after the Babylon Bee for sharing misinformation. Mm -hmm. You know, talking about how she had been monitoring the Babylon Bee for sharing misinformation, and so and then she's talking about how we just use satire as a shield to prevent ourselves from getting blocked. But off she's Facebook an ex CIA agent, so what does yeah. that mean? Like, what's her well, connection? Well, the the, to the, the, the thinking yeah. is that that had been a pattern of thought within that agency. You know, uh -huh. is, that, is that people like the Babylon yeah. Bee are sharing misinformation? At what point? I mean, because people used to this is kind of faded, but it'll come back. There, you know, the, there's a distinction between a uh, publisher and a platform or whatever. Yeah. But I mean, because you would say you. We, nobody wants uh, the government to come to the Babylon Bee or to reason and say, you have to carry this speech. Right. But at what point then, what what makes Twitter different that you might be okay with saying, okay, you know what, this should be treated like a public utility. It's like the old phone system where anybody can make a call about anything they want and you can't block that. Yeah, well, and I, I don't... I don't know that I entirely agree with that argument mm -hmm. either. That that you know the publisher versus mm -hmm. platform distinction. I think that whole thing is a little misunderstood from a legal right. perspective. Yeah, yeah. I don't think well, that, it's invented. It's made up, or it, it's not anywhere in the like, it, like the two thirty thing isn't isn't the protection for social media that people think it is. Right. I think. So I, I don't know that I entirely agree with that yeah. either. So I I don't know what the answer is. Okay. But my but my my feeling is culturally, no matter what you yeah. think legally, culturally we're in a really bad place when the mm -hmm. place where ninety percent of speech occurs is online. And it's all controlled by the left and big tech. Yeah. What's the answer? I don't know. Okay. I think we do need to build alternative platforms. I think we do need to build our own stuff. But as soon as we do that, they kick us off Amazon servers. Right. You know. So well, let's talk about that because I think one of the most interesting things from a from a libertarian or from a market perspective is your response to the Twitter stuff is not simply to say, okay, well, Twitter's closed off to us and we'll just drop it. You have really robustly built out your online infrastructure. You have like more uh, subscription plans and you're pumping out more material in a place, in an environment that you control, um, including, you know, creating an, a social, a kind of social media network, right? That And that's part of not the be. Yeah, not yeah. to be social. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Because this is, you know, it's kind of like you got kicked out of one city in a valley and you're building a kind of shining city on a hill for <laughs> yeah. yourselves, right? It's true. Yeah, yeah. We built a little social network on the back of our not the be website, mm -hmm. which is also kind of connected. Right. And it's a back end for both sites, you know. So mm -hmm. that's what we're building out is that you log into Babylon B and now you can share Babylon B articles with other Babylon right. B subscribers. And so, you know, it's almost almost a classic internet forum model right. where I used to be yeah. that we didn't all go to Facebook to talk about things. You know, if you were a, a hobby car enthusiast, you went to the car forum, you know. Right, right. <laughs> and yeah. it was so like of, use that and then various So you're starting other to see that fragmentation there. as people are, yeah. are doing all that stuff. So I do think it's exciting to see that because yeah. of the pressure that we're facing on social media, we just said, okay, well, we're going to move over here. Right. But at some point that breaks down because like, you know, we could get cut off by payment processors right. or banks or... Has, uh, has that happened, Jim? We haven't gotten cut, yeah. cut off. I mean, this is, I, I agree with you broadly, uh, you know, it's disturbing. And you mentioned Amazon Web Services when, you know, when back end things that nobody 
you know, th- you don't think about it. Yeah, yeah, there's no reputational kind of value of, say, you know, when when places like that get pressure to say like, we don't want you carrying this website, even though nobody knows which you know who your backend, right. where, where your where your pages are hosted. That's totalitarian or it's totalist. It's very disturbing for yeah. sure. Yeah, we've had stuff like Mailchimp. Well, suspending right. us for a while. You know, we've yeah. had stuff like our email front end that kicked us off. You yeah. know, that it's hard to even make an appeal. Like, right. I need to go get some script. Oh, our email Do you like, what about, I mean, but then we see a proliferation of places like Substack that are, at least for the time being, explicitly uh, committed to not being MailChimp in terms of like, we're, we don't, as long as you are not breaking the law or, you know, uh, we don't really care what you're writing about. Yeah. I, I mean, that's great, good, right? I think that's a great thing. And I think that's a great adaptation that the market has made. I don't know if it's going to completely solve the problem, yeah. but I also don't want government involved. So I don't know. I just write jokes on the internet. Yeah. yeah. Can I ask uh, just a uh, kind of final broader question? I mean, you're, you're a, a born-again, Bible-believing, evangelical Christian. Uh, you're a stranger in a strange land, right? Because, um, you know, what, what maybe 20% of America is evangelical, or no, Whatever smaller is, than that, yeah. right? Yeah, but... Um, is there a real tension because like you know you believe you come from a belief system that believes in revealed truth that is absolute that is unchanging and that calls upon you to act in a particular way and it's like you're going to render unto caesar what is caesar's but there comes a point where it's like no you're not going to participate how do, how does that feel like i mean do you are you waiting for that moment where you are going to have to you know kind of cut yourself off from secular society around you well the christian is is prepared for this because you know jesus already told us like the world hates him so mm-hmm. imagine how they're going to treat you you know right. um but he also says let's face it you're not jesus I, and it's true you know? <laughs> but he says take heart because i have already yeah. overcome the world you know yeah. and i think i think there's a there's a there's a little bit of being based to being a christian nowadays mm-hmm. and i'm okay with that like i'm okay yeah. to not be like everybody else right and so I don't think I don't think there's a fear or a worry. I think there's almost an excitement. The Christian church has always flourished under persecution. Right. You know, the Christian church is growing much faster in China than it's growing here. Yeah. Despite it being banned in China. And I, you know, I I, I was thinking of that because we're mere steps away from uh, Caesar's Palace, the casino yeah, right. in Vegas, and they Caesar's have the Palace. and they have the Colosseum. And I was <laughs> I was I was talking with my son about I was telling him about the early Christians. You yeah. know, it's um. But do you feel like American culture in your lifetime, you know, there was a period in uh, in the 70s and in the 80s, especially, where Christianity, or the religious right, evangelical Christianity, seemed to be a growing and do- almost dominant cultural force. Um, it would rarely admit to that, but it really was, you know, it, it moved politics in a big way. It it created a lot of cultural phenomena that were became broadly popular. Um, are those days over, or do you do you think, you know, is Christianity, uh, evangelical Christianity, shrinking as a source of cultural power in America? Well, I hope so, because we made a lot of bad Christian art in those days. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah, and I think the you know, I, I think there's a bit of a culling. You know, you're having a lot of people, especially mm-hmm. during the pandemic, that stopped yeah. going to church. But you know, we kind of wonder how committed were they anyway. Mm-hmm. You know. And I don't, you know, if we're attracting big crowds, but these people's lives aren't being changed and they're, mm-hmm. j- they're just there for cultural power, then we don't really, we don't really mind, you know, that mm-hmm. now we're kind of seeing who the true believers now are. Now you're sounding like the certain aspects of the libertarian movement. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, it's like, we don't need big numbers. We just need hard people, right? That are, we're okay uh, that with we that. need true believers. Um, <laughs> is there a way, uh, you know, one, one story that we tell about America, um, and I say this as someone who's raised Catholic, you know, this was a story I was told is that, re- um, America ultimately was a place of religious toleration and that that spread out into different, uh, you know, into a secular form of toleration where the genius of the country really is that we have enormous numbers of people who come from very different backgrounds and believe very different things, some religious, some secular, whatever. And that kind of the genius of the, of the country is that we can create a, uh, you know, a governance system, not government, but just like a, a kind of operating system where as many of us can live peaceably together without killing each other. And, you know, you get to you get to live your truth and try and persuade me into your group. I do the same. Is that a, you know, is that a, a version of America that 
um, is attractive to you? And then if it is, are, are we failing to do that though? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's great. I love, I love personal liberty and personal freedom. And I think a lot of those values were thought up in the West, you know, because mm -hmm. of Christianity. Absolutely. I, I mean, relig uh, freedom of conscience, the right to believe, you know, what you believe and, and act on that is like central to, you know, 17th century British, to the Reformation, ultimately to America. I still worry, though, that the freedom, you know, that freedom still mm -hmm. needs a common culture, you know, mm -hmm. and that doesn't have to be, you know, a Christo-fascist <laughs> regime or something. Right. But, uh, but I do think there needs to be a kind of a common appreciation mm -hmm. of some traditional values. Yeah. And I, I wonder how we, how we manage that when the country is so far divided and polarized right now. Mm -hmm. You know, when we can't agree on what a man is, mm -hmm. can we have that kind of tolerance and freedom? What is a man? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> no, seriously. Yeah, I... what, yeah, you know, it's, uh, it's X, Y chromosomes, you know. Yeah. So... <laughs> okay. That doesn't get us very far, though, right? Yeah. But um, what would, uh, what, you know, looking forward to the next couple of years, uh, you know, certainly in the political arena, nothing, nothing's going to get better, right? Like we are, well, the only thing we know is we're falling and we're, you know, we're, we're not near the, the bottom, probably, where we're going to hit. Um, what are the types of things that might, might allow for, um, you know, a kind of settling of saying, okay, here are the three, four, five basic things that we all agree on as Americans. And then now, you know, as long as that's settled, then we can go about trying to persuade each other to, you know, you... You join my tribe, I join your tribe, thing. or we come up with new tribes. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, and the new new tribes may be the way to go. You know, mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I, I increasingly don't see a way for America to reconcile beyond, mm -hmm. you know, secession. <laughs> yeah, which is not necessarily, it uh, doesn't have a great track record. It doesn't have a no. great track record. You know, The Onion wrote a joke in the, about peace in the Middle East where they said uh, that, that a, a new peace treaty was going to be 380 million little... You yeah. know, as each person, right, their own. right, yeah. And oh, you just discovered, you know, individualism and freedom, right, you know, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, inadvertently making a joke that was pointing towards that. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know practically how we see that in our lifetime. Mm -hmm. But I do feel like uh, G.K. Chesterton had a quote that um, <sighs> another Catholic. I know what another Catholic. I, you're right? going soft, man. He, uh, the Catholics had the best quotes. Protestants yeah. don't do as well. But uh, yeah. he had a quote about how all, all politics should be as local as possible. And he right. said the, that that uh, uh, the politician who keep your politicians close enough where you can kick them. Yeah. And uh, he says, it's a shame how many politicians, uh, how few politicians are hanged. Yeah. Which <laughs> maybe okay. That could get you banned that can from get Twitter, kick, I think. Kick us off. Yeah. 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 yeah I, I, I tweet that occasionally and it hasn't gotten me banned on yeah. Twitter yet. But, um, but that's, you know, I, I do believe that what we've seen through the pandemic is local elections, local mm -hmm. politics, keeping things as local as we can is one of the solutions. Okay. Well, we're going to leave it there. Thank you, Kyle Mann Thank of you. the Babylon Bee. It was great talking. Awesome. Thank you so much.